Uh, the Poverty Promise and Possibility Initiative is a uh, big collaboration between a number of different university and community organizations. I won't go over the complete list. I'll just ask you to take a look at the brochure here. I trust everyone got a copy. Uh, and uh, this should fill you in on the mission of Poverty Promise and Possibility, past events, upcoming events, direct you to the website. Uh, all the information you need to know is on here. I'm Bart Schultz, the director of the Civic Knowledge Project. Uh, we're one of the partnering organizations, along with our host institution this evening, the School of Social Service Administration. I can't thank them enough. Uh, their faculty and administration have been absolutely wonderful in supporting this initiative. So uh, every evening I try to go on record here to thank people like Julie Jung over here for her good work in making this happen. The one thing I have to say, though, before uh, we get to our distinguished speaker this evening is that uh, this needs to be updated. Uh, the uh, initiative has been a terrific success this year and we have consequently decided to continue it uh, next year, the 2011-12 academic year. So some of the events listed as coming up here later in the spring such as the talk, the public discussion by Evelyn Broadkin, uh, those uh, have been pushed back to next autumn. So please take note. Uh, you need to check the website. The address is on here. It's very easy. HTTP colon backslash backslash povertyinitiative.uchicago.edu. Please go to the website for the most current information uh, because some of those talks have been rescheduled. Crucially, of course, we want to see you back here again uh, for the community forum in May and then for uh, the events that we'll pick up in the autumn, uh, beginning with another community forum early in October on October 6th. All that information again is on the website. Please be sure to check it and please come back. So uh, this evening, uh, I'm delighted to be introducing Professor Scott Allard from the School of Social Service Administration. Uh, according to his uh, <laughs> biography here on the experts blurb. Rumors on the internet, right? <laughs> Scott Allard is a leading expert on poverty and services to the poor, as well as the financial crisis in social service agencies and nonprofits. He has recently completed two surveys of more than 2,000 governmental and nonprofit social service providers in seven urban and rural communities. He is the author of Out of Reach, Place, Poverty and the New American Welfare State, 2008, which explores the accessibility and stability of social service agencies serving low-income populations in urban America. That's an incredibly important book, and it was instrumental, actually, in the launching of the Poverty Promise and Possibility Initiative. Uh, as we all know, uh, urban poverty is a, a horrific problem. And even when there are resources out there, social service agencies doing good work, connecting to them is a big part of the issue. It's one thing to have it on paper. It's another thing to have it there in a usable form. Uh, Professor Allard is an expert on precisely those issues. He has a lot to tell us, too, about the changing nature of urban poverty. Uh, there have been many controversies in connection with the recent census data. And those are things that Professor Allard uh, is very, very well qualified to speak to. So uh, I hope you'll be asking him a lot of questions about uh, his work, the recent census controversies, and uh, much else besides. With that, please give Professor Scott Allard a warm welcome. He's going to be talking about places in need, the changing geography of poverty in the United States. Thanks so much, Bart. That's a wonderful introduction. One of the nice things about coming to the University of Chicago a few years ago, uh, one of them is opportunities to speak to audiences like this where you get to get out from behind your desk, get out from the ivory tower a little bit, although we're still kind of in the ivory tower, I guess, but talk to people from a broad range of the community and, and from the, the university. It's a neat treat. And also, one of the neat things about coming to the University of Chicago is to have colleagues like Bart who, uh, who, who uh, support your work and, and help you think about new ideas and, uh, and help you form new collaborations. And I, I just want to congratulate him on this series this year. I think it's been great. Uh, it's an honor to be part of it. Um, 
and, uh, and, and I look forward to continue to be, uh, make contributions as we move forward to year two of Poverty Promise and Possibilities. Um, before I start, um, I'd like to thank the funders who've supported this research to date. Uh, what you're gonna get is a, some work in progress, a new book project um, that currently is called Places in Need. And it's about uh, the shifting geography of poverty, poverty moving uh, out from cities uh, into suburban areas, but also uh, poverty uh, increasing in the suburban areas around us due to factors that are uh, unique to those places, not driven by out-migration necessarily. Um, so it's a work in progress. So this is a great uh, opportunity to, 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 to develop some tables and charts. If you have questions, um, I'm looking forward to a robust discussion during the Q&A. And uh, also before I start, in addition to thanking the funders, I'd like to thank my RAs uh, uh, who've helped with this work, uh, especially a few research assistants in particular, Ben Roth, uh, Matt Moronic, and Jennifer Coey, who've been really invaluable to, to helping me uh, get to this uh, point. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a road map. Here's what I hope we can cover tonight. We have a little bit more than an hour or so. Um, I think I'll start by speaking about the conventional wisdom surrounding place and poverty, maybe the way that, that we're, we're taught in classes to think about it, the way that is familiar to us, the way that popular culture and media connect uh, to issues of place and poverty. And then I'll discuss some population shifts over the last decade that maybe challenge this conventional wisdom, and maybe lead us to challenge some of the assumptions we make about place and poverty uh, in the US. Um, I'll focus um, on a set of analyses looking at uh, county level poverty trends in the US and, and, and give you some ideas on what might be driving recent changes in poverty. Uh, and I'll have some data on the Chicago metro area as well. I think what's important to realize that is that this isn't just an interesting kind of data exercise, that the changes in the geography of poverty uh, and the changes in our population overall have a lot of consequences for governance, uh, for institutions, for community-based organizations, and as I'll point out tonight, for the safety net. Um, and I'll spend some time thinking about politics and policy at the end. Um, if everything goes to plan, we should have plenty of time for Q&A um, and, uh, and discussion. Um, and if I start to roam, I've been instructed to roam with a mic a little bit so we can get good photos of all the, the audience. So if I start doing that, uh, know that that's intended and planned. Well, we can, we can we'll, we'll hook you up with a waiver and then I'm sure you'll get a proceed, you know, a, 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 you know, a royalty check, you know. We'll hook it up, whatever you need, right? Um, <laughs> so, as, as we're familiar, the conventional wisdom in the U.S. Uh, about the relationship between place and poverty is that poverty is, a unique, is, a, is an urban phenomenon. Um, you see this in media. You see this in research that is produced. Uh, we, we, we almost exclusively conceive of and discuss poverty as an urban phenomenon. And in part, this is because poverty rates have been much higher in cities and in suburbs uh, for many decades, and the gap between cities and suburbs had been growing or widening for many decades in the, in, in the latter part of the 20th century. Part of the conventional wisdom also is that poverty isn't just an urban phenomenon, but it's undeserving poverty that we perceive to be an urban phenomenon. That people who are poor in cities are poor not because of the lack of jobs or the lack of good schools, but because they're not making the right choices, they're not working. And so part of the conventional wisdom, I would argue, is that undeserving poverty is an urban phenomenon. I don't know if that is, a, I don't believe that to be true. I think uh, there's a lot of evidence that urban poor families work a lot. Many work two jobs um, or more. Um, but yet, I think this is part of the myth of, of poverty in the US. By contrast, we think of suburbs as destinations of opportunity. Initially, suburbs were where Americans went to achieve the American dream of home ownership and driving a big fancy car down a big fancy highway. Um, suburbs as residential areas gave way to suburbs as employment centers. And so in the latter part of the 20th century, suburbs are where job growth occurred and where job opportunities were most available. So the, the familiar narrative would be urban as as a location of poverty and suburban as a location of opportunity. There's also a racial or ethnic and ethnic component to this where we think of cities as being 
a place of urban, perhaps black or Latino poverty, and suburbs as being a place of white affluence, middle class affluence. Um, at, its, at its worst, this conventional wisdom then promotes prejudice, stereotypes, and fear. I don't think this conventional wisdom has ever been true. Cities have never been solely places of poverty. Uh, suburbs have never been solely places of lily white opportunity. But this conventional wisdom matters and, and, and for all kinds of reasons, even if it isn't necessarily true to the data or true our experience. Actually, there's a great New York Times piece today by a gentleman who was covering the suburbs outside of the city of New York. And he kind of speaks to this, that this myth of suburban America has never been true. And he tried to capture that in his articles. Um, but the conventional wisdom, whether we disagree with it or not, matters for all kinds of reasons. One, there are many policies that reinforce, preserve, or exacerbate the distinctions between urban and suburban between, and, and are based on this conventional wisdom. And many scholars point to infrastructure development decisions, whether it's in housing or roadways or freeways, these kinds of investments have reinforced or, 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 um, or cemented, if you will, some of these distinctions between urban and, and suburban as we create pathways for people to, uh, to, to leave cities. Policies that permit housing segregation are another example, and there is a rich uh, uh, scholarly literature on that topic as well. Second. The conventional wisdom matters because we target our safety net resources, public and private, in our cities. The safety net is, is predicated on the concentration of urban poverty. And to the extent that that is no longer true, not only will our safety net not serve our central city or urban residents very well, which you could argue it doesn't, but it won't serve residents in suburban communities very well either, or people who are moving out to suburban areas in, in search of better opportunities for their families. And then finally, I think the conventional wisdom matters because politics follows this urban-suburban dichotomy. We, our political institutions reflect the gap or the divide between urban and suburban. So we have very fragmented institutions of metropolitan governance. We have uh, immense competitive pressures which push us apart rather than bring us together to solve solutions in a regional manner. And there is not a, a strong sense that there are any shared fates or shared agendas or shared goals, even though there should be. Before I start to show you some charts, which uh, I apologize that I'll be showing you lots of charts tonight. Um, actually, I don't have to apologize for that. Um, I'm not happy about the data. Um, I want to say a couple words about why this is tough to study. First, one of the first reasons why it's difficult to study the geography of poverty, particularly in the current time period, is because there are so many different trends occurring simultaneously that are uh, leading to increased rates of poverty both in cities and in suburbs. And it's difficult to tease out exactly what matters and exactly what is going on. And that's one challenge. And I, I won't get to that too much tonight, but that is definitely a challenge for the research. Another challenge is finding the right data. We don't have great data to study the geography of poverty. We have census data, which is very useful, but a lot of the other data sets that we use to study issues of social policy, poverty, and employment among low-skill, low-wage workers aren't provided at, a, at, at a, a level where we can do really sophisticated geographic analysis. So it's hard for us to know uh, where people live and what resources they have access to. So there are data issues. And I solve that by looking at many different data sources, but there are many holes and gaps that remain. Um, and then finally, um, the, the, there are definitional challenges. It may be surprising, it may not be surprising, that there's no official definition of what a suburb is. There are definitions of metropolitan areas, there are definitions of, of census tracts, of congressional districts, but we don't define what a suburb is officially. And so our definitions often are what is convenient for us. And so tonight I will make the convenient decision to talk about uh, geography, about suburbs as being county-based. At times I'll talk about them as municipal-based. Um, that is not always the best way to proceed, but I argue that, I, that, that counties and municipalities are maybe the right level of analysis in this kind of work because that's where we deliver safety net programs. And so if you're interested in the geography of poverty, you should be interested in the geography of the safety net, and that's how we make decisions, that's where we make decisions about eligibility, about resource allocation, and about the delivery of programs. And I think that'll become clear as we talk. 
So what I'll talk about tonight, I'll start, uh, uh, just initially I'll talk about some population change that I think challenges the conventional wisdom and gets us to think differently about urban and suburban poverty and hopefully gets us to think about the shared fate that we have as communities, as metropolitan communities. Um, I'll start by talking about the 2010 census, um, uh, look at some data in, in, related to Chicago but also national data. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about changes in race and ethnicity across urban and suburban areas. Then I'll spend some time talking about uh, the, the last decade that was bookended by economic recession, uh, something that we forget uh, because we've been so focused on the Great Recession. And then I'll talk about how these trends come together, these demographic and economic trends come together to change uh, the geography of poverty and change the, the narrative or the con conventional wisdom. So, Bart alluded to controversies around the 2010 census, and I imagine he's alluding to some of the data about population loss in the city of Chicago, particularly among uh, African the African American community. Uh, and so I'll try to say a little bit about this, but I'm happy to answer questions and, and, and answer them to the best I can. Um, the data that you are seeing in the media today about the 2010 census comes from mail-in forms that many of you mailed in a year ago. In fact, actually almost a year ago, I hosted a conference in our lobby here uh, about the census, and, and it was designed to get the mail-in rates of these mail-in forms uh, up. There was concern that if we didn't have enough, a good enough response rate, we would have an undercount, and, and uh, an undercount affects the city budget uh, in terms of what they get from the federal government in addition to redistricting for congressional purposes. But these mail-in data, uh, it's a mail-in form and then there's a follow-up enumeration process that the census per performs for a couple months after the mail-in forms are due. And this is good data, but it reflects the bias in who mails in their form and it reflects the bias in who responds to the enumerator that comes to their door. And you may not be surprised that many of the populations who are most vulnerable in our community are those that are hardest to count, they're the hardest uh, to get great mail-back uh, rates for the form, and they're also the hardest to enumerate with follow-ups. And so it's not surprising that we might undercount those individuals with this data. Um, but we did pretty well as a metro area. Um, and, and again, I could talk a little bit more about that. Most scholars use the American Community Survey now, which is a census product that's based on a sample of the population. And it's an annual survey that asks really detailed questions. You might remember that your, your, your mail-in form only asked you a handful of questions about your, your uh, ethnicity or race, uh, your age, the number of people in the household. The American Community Survey generates a lot more questions, a lot more information about our population, about income, about work, about education, about uh, family composition, and that becomes a really important component of, our, um, of, our, of the work we do. Um, but it's not the same as the 2010 census. Um, it's good to know that we get largely the same results, although there are some slippages which I could talk to in the Q&A. So here's our first chart. I, I know the numbers don't show up, but the, the bars are, are going to be illustrative. This chart represents data from the 2010 mail-in form uh, uh, data, the 2010 short form census data in Metro Chicago. The blue bars, or the darker bars, are changes in total population in terms of number of people. The red bars reflect uh, increases or decreases in the number of African Americans. And green bars represent changes in the Hispanic population. Um, and as you look across, the city of Chicago is on the far left, followed by Cook County. And then on the right side, there's kind of a vertical line there. On the right side of that are the suburban counties in the metro area, DuPage, Kane, Lake, McHenry. I parse out suburban Cook County and Will County. Now these numbers are in thousands, and so if you can see the numbers, you, you'll, you'll know that. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that, the, that there's kind of a, a line that runs through the middle of the chart. Bars that fall below that line indicate losses of population, and bars that are above that line indicate growth. And one of the things you notice right away when you look at this chart is that suburban areas had growth in the last 10 years. This is differences from 2000 to 2010. Um, and some pretty dramatic increases. You see fairly significant growth in Kane and Will County. But across all counties, you see increases in the, in, the, in the population and in different population subgroups. Now, one reason you might look at this and say, wow, well, it looks like some of those green bars are higher, particularly in, in DuPage or, Will, or uh, su suburban Cook County, where you see large increases in the, in the number of Latinos, but not large overall population increases. That's because there was a loss of non-Hispanic whites during the, that period that basically 
negated any of the population growth that you might have expected, um, which is an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. Um, but you do see dramatic Hispanic growth in our population. This is true not just in Chicago, this is a national trend. And this isn't just a story of immigrants who recently came to the US. This is a story of families who've been here for decades and, and fertility and, and growth of those families. It's a story of Hispanics moving uh, uh, from other parts of the country to Chicago because of job opportunities, because it's a great place to live. And it also is a story about immigration. It's just not a story only about immigration. Um, and as we know, and, and as uh, has been shown in the newspaper, the data s indicate a decrease, a really significant decrease in the African-American population in the city of Chicago. Now the decrease you see from the 2010 census data, from the, the short form data, is much larger than what we see in the American Community Survey. And there could be all kinds of reasons for that, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But there's a sense that uh, we've lost African-American population to suburbs of Chicago, but also to other places, maybe back to the south where families have a have ancestral networks and connections, uh, maybe to other uh, metropolitan areas uh, where job opportunities may be better, maybe to places where schools are better, safer, neighborhoods are better, where you can afford a house, um, all kinds of reasons. Um, but this is an important transformation in the city. When we think about these results, how should we view them? Three things come to mind for me as I looked at these data when they came through. First, we're a suburban nation. This is a relatively recent development in the history of the U.S. in that the number of people who lived in suburbs eclipsed the number of people who lived in cities about halfway through the last decade. Prior to that, we were an urban nation, which for about 100 years, when we go way back, we used to be a rural nation back in the 19th century. Um, but now we're a suburban nation. And so the, the, the trends you see in Chicago are trends that we're seeing everywhere in the country, both in the Northeast and the Midwest, but also in the Southeast, Southwest, and West Coast. So Chicago is, is no different. We are uh, we are on, on the same page as most places. Another thing I thought about is, is uh, what role did the CHA plan for transformation play in some of the changes we see in our population? You don't have to drive too many times past where Robert Taylor Homes used to be or live in that neighborhood and know how different that neighborhood is or where Cabrini Green is on the north side to know that we've displaced a lot of people. And one of the consequences, whether intended or unintended, to the CHA Plan for Transformation is we've pushed a large number of families outside the city. And I think that shows up in these data as well. Now, one, I did read a headline when this came out. It said, Mass Exodus. And it was a story about Chicago. And I think maybe that's a nice media headline to get your attention. But we're not a dying city by any means. We've had population loss uh, fairly steadily for the last uh, several decades. It may be striking uh, still to see it, but we're still the third largest metropolitan area in the country, and we're 50% larger than the next one, Dallas. So it's not, we're not a dying city. We're a robust, growing metropolitan area. The city of Chicago is going through demographic change, um, but I don't know if this is a mass exodus. I think I would be more concerned about the persistent um, intergenerational poverty, the persistent unemployment, the persistent lack of access to good schools that we have in the city. I think that's an issue we should worry about. I don't think we should be worried about population loss at this point. So I told you that I would talk about one decade and two recessions because this is you know, an uplifting talk, right? We're gonna talk about poverty and we're gonna talk about two recessions. And so it's gonna be really, it'll be really um, uplifting. But we focus so much on the Great Recession that we forget often that the decade started with a recession in 2001. In fact, the recession that started in 2001 was, is pretty important to understand the context into which we entered the recession that started in 2007. And the last 10 years basically have been bookended by economic downturn. Now this chart shows you unemployment rates by educational attainment. If I can make my laser pointer work, this line here represents individuals without a high school degree. The next line here represents individuals with a high school degree. The dotted line are individuals with some college, maybe an associate's degree. And then these are college graduates or higher. And these are unemployment rates, March, uh, seasonally adjusted unemployment rates from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
And so you see in 2001, we have a recession that starts. And you see that unemployment rates for all education uh, 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 subgroups increase over the next few years. And actually, even after the recession ends in 2002, unemployment continues to increase for people without a high school degree. The other groups, it either levels off uh, or, or declines some. But it isn't until about 2007 when we get back to pre-recession unemployment levels. And then what happens, right? Just as we get back, just as people get back to where they were before the 2001 recession, the Great Recession hits, and it is much more dramatic in its effects on workers than the last recession. Unemployment rates jump uh, uh, to over 14% uh, for individuals without a high school degree, but even individuals with a high school degree, unemployment rates are about 10%. What I think is also striking here is if you look at the, the worst unemployment rates for people without a high school degree uh, back in the mid-2000s, um, in, in what was a jobless recovery for many people at the lower end of the labor market, you see that people with a high school degree today are still above that point, and people even who went to college and maybe didn't finish or maybe only got an associate's degree, unemployment rates for those folks are, are, are close to that level. And I think this reflects a change in our labor market that will confront us and challenge us moving forward. Uh, and that returns to, there's gonna be a higher premium on returns to education, a higher premium on not just going to high school, but going to college, not just going to college, but getting a degree. And even though unemployment rates are, are dipping down, they're still at historical highs and they're still well above even uh, their recession levels uh, um, at the beginning of the decade. One important thing to, rem to keep in mind too is how this, this recession affected our metropolitan areas. It's had a big effect on our cities, as many of you know, but it actually hit our suburbs harder and earlier than it hit our cities, which is something we don't often realize. In fact, actually, this was the first recession that hit suburban America with any kind of real power or punch something we often don't think about. If you look at unemployment trends, this is a paper that Emily Garr uh, just put out from the Brookings Institution. I'm a, I'm a non-residential fellow there, which means they, there's no desk. I could show up and they'll be nice to me, but there's no desk, so don't, don't start camping out here. Um, but the great work at the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, Emily's uh, got a paper that shows that about 6.6 .6 million people became unemployed between 2007 and 2010, between December of 2007 and December of 2010 during this recession. About 1.5 million of those folks were living in cities and about 3 million were living in suburbs. And that kind of gives you a sense of how profound this effect was on suburban America. That does not mean this was easy in cities, it just means that it was, uh, that, that suburbs took a punch in a way that they hadn't before. And particularly high density, mature, inner ring suburbs really uh, uh, were really hit hard by this recession. So these economic factors combine to transform poverty from being maybe, you know, what we think of as primarily an urban phenomenon to clearly a suburban as well as an urban phenomenon. In fact, you won't see it in the data tonight, but Emily has another study where if you look at the number of people who live in the number of people who are poor, who are living below the federal poverty line, who are in the central cities of our largest 100 metropolitan areas, and you look at the people who are living in poverty who are in the suburbs of those, hundred, of those cities in the top 100 metros, you will find that there are more poor people numerically in suburbs than there are in cities. And that happened for the first time in this past decade. Um, again, another dramatic phenomenon. Now this change is driven by a number of factors. Shifts in the racial and ethnic composition of our suburban communities, immigration and out-migration, persistent unemployment as you saw, changes in household composition. I won't have many data points on this, but the collapse of the housing market mattered for a couple reasons. It affected people's homes, but it also affected jobs that were connected to, um, connected, uh, to the housing industry. Now, keep in mind, you'll, I'll show you data, and they're aggregated over urban versus suburban, but there's not one type of suburban poverty, and there's not one cause that's been driving this. It's a, con a confluence of forces, or a, uh, is that the right word? Um, I guess, I'll say it is. Um, it's, a, it's a set of forces that come together, maybe unique in some places than others, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, just not one story of suburban poverty uh, here tonight. 
So here's some more data. This is a table drawn from the American Community Survey and from the 2000 census. So the American Community Survey is that sample that I told you about, the annual survey of, of Americans that, that we um, use as scholars often. And this shows poverty rates for people living in urban counties of small versus large metropolitan areas. So small metro areas are about a million people or less. Large metro areas are more than a million people. And it shows the poverty rates for people living in the suburbs of those small and large metro areas. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the limitation of looking at counties is that places like Cicero, which are a suburb, get counted in the urban county because they're within Cook County. Um, but really, they are suburbs. And, and, and you know, if we parse them out by municipalities, they would, they would fall in. So these data are going to be a little different from some of the data you might see if we looked at munici municipalities. One thing you'll notice is that poverty rates increased across both urban and suburban counties in the last decade both across small and large metropolitan areas. You'll notice that suburbs still have lower poverty rates overall, but actually the change, the percentage change in poverty rate is, it was, it was much higher among suburban communities. One other thing you'll notice is that the changes in the number of poor people are much larger in suburban areas than in urban areas. And you'd see this even greater if we were looking at municipal level data. So here you see that in suburbs of the largest metropolitan counties, there was a 19% increase in the number of poor people in the last decade compared to about 11% in the, in the urban counties of those metro areas. Now, for the home audience, we're from Chicago. This gives you a sense of how poverty's changed at the municipal level in metro Chicago. You see a few decreases, Evanston, Waukegan, um, but mostly increases, and increases of fairly large numbers. In fact, actually, Cook County has some of the, kind of among the smallest increases in the number of poor people from 1999. These data go to 2008. But you see across the metro area, no matter where you go, large increases in the number of poor people. So we might ask ourselves, what's driving this, right? So we think it's economic. But are there other factors at hand? And so one thing that, that scholars might look at is changes in the population composition. And if you looked at the data that I showed you from the 2010 census, you would say, wow, well, there's been a big change in the ethnic composition or the racial composition of suburbs in Chicago. Maybe that's true elsewhere, and it is. And so here I, I, I'll show you a couple things. One, this shows you the percentage population change of black population and Hispanic population across urban and suburban counties in large and small metro areas. And what you'll see is that sub suburbs have become much more diverse in terms of race and ethnicity over the last decade. And although not all blacks or all Hispanics are poor, the poverty rate is higher among these groups than other ethnic groups, other than you know, groups, whites or other ethnic groups. And so we might expect that as uh, low-income African-Americans or Hispanics move to suburbs for better housing, better schools for their kids, better access to jobs, safer neighborhoods, whatever, uh, working poor families, um, that poverty rates might increase in these communities. So part of it might be a demographic story um, here. Um, part of the story might be changes in household composition. And, and one, of the, one of the realities of suburban America today is there are a lot more single female-headed households than there used to be. Now again, not all Single female-headed households are poor, um, um, but poverty rates are much higher among female-headed households than other uh, types of households. And here you see, actually, in the suburbs of our largest metro areas, really, really large increases uh, compared to the cities of those, of those metros. And so we might think that there's something about household composition um, that's going on as well. I think the key point here and this is where the complexity comes in. The key point is that there's not one factor. And it's not just as simple as out-migration from the city. So one of the, the natural reflexes of reporters or policymakers when they see data on poverty rising in the suburbs is that, well, that's because people moved out of the city of Chicago to the suburbs. That's part of it. It's a small part of it. In fact, in some places, it's not even part of it at all. It depends on the area you look at. In Chicago, it's a small part of it. But instead, what's really driving this is lack of ec economic opportunity or changing economic opportunity in suburbs. Part of it is out-migration, part of it might be changes in race and ethnicity, but most of it's changes in economic opportunity. 
And one reason I believe this is true is I've been out talking to nonprofit service organizations in suburbs and in cities for the last several years. You know, Bart was kind enough to, to, to bring up my book, Out of Reach, where I interviewed about, uh, about 1,500 organizations for that book, and then I've interviewed probably another six or 700 for other projects since then. And my colleague Ben Roth and I have been out in the suburbs of Chicago, LA, and DC interviewing providers, and they tell us a story about need in those communities that's very different than what you might expect if this was a story about people moving out to the suburbs, you know, who are poor and, and just and, and, and being pushed out or fleeing the city. It's um, a story about people losing their jobs, not being able to find jobs. It's the same story that's true in the city, actually. Um, people are struggling because of persistent unemployment, or when they find a job, it doesn't pay what they had before. And so these nonprofits are saying things like, we're seeing clients who have no previous connection to the safety net. We're seeing clients who've exhausted their unemployment insurance. We're seeing people who were playing by the rules. They were working, they owned their home, but they were evicted. They've become homeless. We see people where one or both adults are working but can't make ends meet can't feed their family, so they're coming in to get a bag of food. They're making this tough choice between keeping their car, keeping their house, and feeding their family. You lose your car, you can't get to work, you lose your house, you got no place to live, so you go to the food bank, right? Many people who are coming are two-parent households, kind of defying, again, the stereotype that we have about, about poverty, perhaps. So why does this matter? Why am I up here talking about this? It's not just, as I said, important or interesting demographic work. It doesn't just challenge this kind of nice narrative about urban-suburban relationships, about the poverty-opportunity dichotomy. It has real profound effects on the safety net and on safety net policy. It has real importance to our communities, to our residents, to our schools, to nonprofit organizations. So it, it affects how we provide help and how we come together to provide help. I think one thing to keep in mind, I talk about this a lot when, I, when, I'm, when I'm out talking about this project, that we can't talk about the changing geography of poverty and pretend that cities don't matter. And I don't want you to hear me say that. If we lose sight of the needs of cities, we can't be successful. Right? We can't enter into economic recovery as a country. We can't promote opportunity for everybody if, we only, if only part of our community, right? if the outer edges of our community do better. We still have to pay attention to the needs of our cities. So one thing to think about is how have the cash components of the safety net responded and is there variation geographically there? And what I'm going to show you are some tables that look at three key programs. The first is the earned income tax credit which is administered through the tax code and basically helps make work pay. If you're a low wage worker, uh, you'll get a refund or a credit at tax time. And this has become one of our most important social uh, programs. Um, it delivers roughly $50 billion a year in assistance to low income families. Um, I'll also talk about TANF or welfare, which uh, has become a very different program in the last 20 years. And then I'll talk about SNAP, or, or what, what is called SNAP now, it used to be called food stamps. One thing you'll notice, what I have up here are the median percentage changes. And so I put the median up there. I, you know, I don't want to be like too much of a statistics class on a cloudy Thursday night at 7.15. But the median is nice because it helps us understand what the typical county might be like. It's better than the mean, and it reduces some of the distortion that we would have if we averaged these data out. So the median change in the number of poor people in suburbs in the last decade was almost 32% compared to cities where it was about 18% in these larger metro areas. Um, when you look at the number of people getting the earned income tax credit, the years don't overlap perfectly, but you see um, that they look about the same, that the earned income tax credit has expanded at about the same pace as poverty has increased. That's a good story. That's good news. That means many people are getting benefits that they might need to help support their families. The trick is, is that the earned income tax credit only helps you if you're working. So if you're out of work for a long time, that program's not there to help you. The program that used to be one of our real counter-cyclical, important counter-cyclical programs was TANF, AFDC back in the day. And as you'll see here, 
TANF caseloads have actually fallen in the last decade, and they've actually not increased significantly during the recession. And so one thing to note, and this will be all we'll say about TANF for the rest of the night, is that it is not responsive to economic need. It is not responsive to the need of parents. And, and uh, in many places, uh, the caseloads have no bearing on changes in poverty or need, and no relationship. The last column looks at food stamps or SNAP assistance. And again, like with EITC, you see that SNAP receipt tracks closely to increases in poverty. And we know this is true nationally, that SNAP caseloads have expanded dramatically during the Great Recession, that we spend probably close to 70 or $80 billion a year now, I think, on SNAP. And it is a big, big part of how we provide help to low-income families and to many families that are just above the poverty line as well. The eligibility line is above, just above the poverty line. But these are federal cash assistance programs, right? So we'd expect them to be responsive, irregardless of geography at some level, because they're delivered through the federal government. States don't pay for TANF. They don't pay for SNAP. This is money from the feds. We should be worried if the federal government starts to cut these programs, which might start happening in the next year. Um, but these aren't, these aren't they, we wouldn't expect them to, 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 to look different geographically. What we would expect to, to vary geographically are the social service components of our safety net. And you might say, well, you know, EITC, that's what, 50 billion, food stamps, another 70 billion. You know, social service programs, just a drop in the bucket. I mean, those, are, those pale in comparison to cash assistance programs. That might be the intuition, but actually it's not true. Social service programs, whether they're substance abuse, mental health, employment programs, education, food pantries, housing, child or youth programming, annually we spend about $200 billion a year in public and private money on social service programs. And what I wrote my book out of reach about was where are these social service providers located? We spend all this money on social services and yet we don't think often about where these agencies are located. And if you live in Chicago, you know that there are many neighborhoods that are rich with nonprofit organizations, and there are many neighborhoods that have very few. And we talk a lot about food deserts. A lot of my research is about social service deserts, places where you can go for miles without finding someone that can help you find a job, help you feed your family. So about $200 billion a year, that's, a, that's actually probably an underestimate, compared to about $125 billion we spent on SNAP and the Earned Income Tax Credit, and you could throw in TANF there if you want. Um, one consequence of relying on social service programs to help us, and this is a relatively recent trend, this is only in the last 20 years or so, is that where you live matters, as I noted. So if you don't live near providers, you can't get help. Another key component here, which I won't talk about right now, but I could in the Q&A, is that there is no entitlement to social service programs. There's an entitlement to SNAP or the Earned Income Tax Credit. If you meet eligibility requirements, you get it. Social service programs are completely discretionary. And one of the things that budget that's being cut in the state houses now, as we deal with state budget deficits and as we deal with the federal deficit, are social service programs. And so this sector, which is so critical to helping families achieve greater well-being, achieve economic self-sufficiency, the dollars for those programs contract right at the moment when need expands the most. And so this sector, although very critical, is not responsive to economic cycles as we would hope it, it, it might be. One other, um, one other consequence of relying on social service providers is that um, you would expect there to be some lag effects in that areas where poverty increases dramatically in a short period of time. It will take you some time to get nonprofits and organizations set up in those communities to start providing services. And so it might take a year, it might take five years. We actually don't know very much about that because, as I noted, most of our research is predicated on concentration of urban poverty. But now that we are seeing pockets of poverty emerge in suburbs, we can start to think about this. This is a shot at thinking about this. This is a, a table that I would put in quotes. If you could put a table in quotes saying, I think this is true, um, this would be the table you do, you, you do it with. This comes out of a report that Ben and I did for Brookings, Ben Roth and I did for Brookings. And let me explain it very carefully. At the bottom, you'll see five columns. One's substance abuse, one's mental health, one's employment services, one's food assistance, and one's human services. These are different types of nonprofit service provider cl classifications that come out of IRS data. So what we've done here is we've gone into 67 suburban municipalities in Chicago, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., and we've collected IRS data on the nonprofits that are registered to operate in those communities. And we've sorted them into the type of services they provide, and we've looked to see where providers are located and how much, how much capacity they have. 
So what you'll see is the bottom bar in each column, the bottom chunk of that bar, are the number of municipalities that have no registered nonprofits in that given area. Now this data is tricky, so you know I wouldn't I wouldn't bet I'd bet Bart's paycheck on it. I wouldn't bet my paycheck on it. Um, the yellow areas then are places that have a modest that do have uh, nonprofit organizations, but they only have a modest uh, 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 capacity. And we measure capacity here in terms of revenue per poor person in the community. And so you'll see there's you know organizations that have between one to fifty dollars of revenues per poor person. I don't know if any of you run programs, but you can't run a, a lot of a program for $50 per client. And then all the way up to places that have more than $1,000 per uh, low-income resident. What you'll see here is across the board, whether we're looking at substance abuse or employment services or even food pantries, more than half of the suburban municipalities we visited didn't have a registered nonprofit that operated in one of those areas. Now that doesn't mean there aren't services there. These data are tricky, right? They're IRS registered nonprofit data. Catholic Charities might be operating a program in one of these communities. Their IRS 990 form is downtown where their headquarters are. And so that's where we would find them. We wouldn't find them out in Schaumburg or in, um, in Naperville or, or in one of the suburb, southern suburbs. But I think this map, even though this chart, even though the data are limited, is very telling and very suggestive about what we see in suburbs. And that there are entire areas where there are no providers, entire areas where there are no nonprofits providing help to low-income families. In fact, actually, the results are strikingly similar to what I found in cities. So this slide comes from my book project. And what I did is I tried to look at access in predominantly African-American and predominantly Hispanic neighborhoods access to social services compared to predominantly white neighborhoods. And what I found is that if you lived in a neighborhood that was predominantly black, more than 50% African American, you had 50% less access than if you lived in a predominantly white neighborhood, right? That may not come as a surprise, if, you know, knowing, knowing what we know about the geography of social services in Chicago. If you lived in a predominantly Latino neighborhood, you had about two-thirds as much access or a third less access as a predominantly white neighborhood. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the things I write about is we would not tolerate this level of inequality. Like if I told you, you get a food stamp benefit, but you get 50 cents on the dollar just because of where you live compared to me, we wouldn't tolerate that in our country. But yet we tolerate these kind of mismatches in social services because they're discretionary, because they're voluntary, because communities come together to decide what they should provide and how they should fund it often. So one thing you might ask yourself is how can such mismatches and gaps exist? And how, how, how is it that they exist not only in cities, but why do they also exist in suburbs where we think there are more resources? That's where affluent, that's where we think affluence is. This is the myth of, of suburbs to some degree, is that this is where middle class affluent families live. In part, it's because demand exceeds supply. And that's particularly true in cities, but increasingly it's true in suburban areas where there are more poor people seeking help than providers can help. And, and that's been true in cities for years, and now it's becoming more and more true in suburbs. The, the shared fate of these providers is, is stunning. Um, just like in high poverty central city neighborhoods, there's a lack of public and private funding to support programs. It's true in suburban counties and suburban communities as well. In fact, it's probably more true in that um, anti-poverty programs haven't been a line item in many suburban budgets. Um, foundations in Chicago don't have a suburban presence, right? If you go and look at MacArthur and where they put, make grants, they reach into a few suburbs, but not very many. And, and maybe that's a good decision. Maybe that's what they should do, but as a result, there isn't much private funding or private philanthropy in these communities. Um, cities, as in suburbs, often have a weak nonprofit infrastructure in high poverty areas or areas where poverty has been on the rise. And that is certainly true in the suburban communities we've visited. And then I think one factor that matters, particularly in cities, is there are location preferences that I think mask, not mask, they reveal bias and prejudice in how we, who we want to work with and where we want to go to work. And I think one of the reasons why we have such disparities by race in cities is because providers make decisions about where they want to be and where they want to go to work and where they want to have lunch every day. So when we take this together, we take the changing geography of poverty, and we, change, we, and we start to think about how social services are provided, even just the glimpse I gave you, how they're provided in our communities. What are the implications for our safety net? 
Well, one implication is that this change in poverty has come at the exact wrong time, right? It's come uh, when there's a fiscal crisis, both in the public and in the charitable sectors, in the nonprofit sectors. And all funding sources have been hit. If you're providing help to low-income populations, you've probably had almost every major revenue source uh, uh, hit by the recession. In some places, federal stimulus dollars helped, but this year they're phasing out. And so the problem may get greater or more difficult in some places. And I think important, and hopefully the, the, the tables on the social service providers made this clear, our safety net's not well suited, our social service safety net is not well suited for a change in our poverty narrative. It's not only weakly counter-cyclical to begin with, it's not already unstable. It's not just unstable or weakly counter-cyclical. It's not just mismatched in cities, it's mismatched in suburbs everywhere. And the reality is, is that the, the, the foundation of our safety net, the nonprofit sector, is not very nimble. It's not quick to respond often. It's not able to respond often when, when there's need. And the resources that it needs to be responsive contr are contracting during this time period. And so it makes it difficult for people to find help when they need it and where they need it. So that's pretty depressing, right? Not a lot of optimism, not a lot of promise or possibility, perhaps. Well, I'll give you a question since, since I threatened you with a photograph. Yeah, sure. Maybe a, one, one promise of global warming. Yeah, I, I, I suspect for, I expect that the change in uh, temperature to allow us some significant lie heap savings is pro probably will we'll, we'll come before we finish our, our. She just asked if global warming would allow us to save money on lie heap, basically. And it, it's a. It's an interesting premise. Let me focus, um, before we get to Q&A, on what we can do, right? Where is the promise? Where is the possibility? Because actually, one of the things that, I, that I'm, I'm confident of is that even though the problems might be daunting, even though we might not have services where we need them, I actually think we can do better. And I think, it's, I think that, that, that we have um, some opportunities to do better. And the first thing we have to keep in mind is that the safety net connects to our core values as Americans better than people realize especially the social service components of the safety net, which we're very reliant, but which vary quite a bit by geography and may not be at, a, at, at, their, at their strength right when we need them. But I think we can build support for those programs. If we start to think about how we can connect what those programs do to core values. When you talk to Americans in surveys and you ask them, how should we provide assistance to working poor families? They tell you they want to do it through support services that promote work activity, that help people attain self-sufficiency, that focus on kids, that promote community and education, that are delivered through private, nonprofit, community-based organizations. That's what people want, and that's what we do to the tune of over $200 billion a year, but we don't communicate that very well. Not only do we not understand that from a policy dialogue, but our nonprofits themselves don't sell the message very well. And so I think to the extent that we can start to communicate this better, it might help us make a case for funding, it might make, help us make a case for bringing in new providers or new programs. Short of bringing in new programs, what can we do? Well, we can improve existing, we can improve, improve links to existing help. One of the things that happens in many communities is that there are resources that are available that people just aren't aware of. And so we can use churches or faith-based organizations, food banks and food pantries as ways to conduct outreach, to reach vulnerable groups, to reach people that aren't familiar with the safety net, and there are some interesting models that use information technology to help people connect when they can't travel from point A to point B. Another thing we can do is help suburbs and cities work better together. There's a lot of inefficiency in how we deliver social services and, 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 and anti-poverty assistance today. And if we did a better job of coordinating and collaborating across cities and suburbs, not only would we provide services more efficiently or assistance more efficiently, but we actually might do it in a way that fits people's lives. Because today, you're eligible for assistance in your community. But we work in many, you know, often we work in different places. Our kids might go to school in different places. And so if we had a system that was a little bit more flexible geographically, that might be useful as well. I think we need to strengthen our community-based nonprofits. 
And this comes, this, this comes not from the top down as much from the bottom up. Um, one of the realities of social service providers is that they become heavily dependent on government dollars to the point that they've abandoned private fundraising and private giving. Um, and as government dollars dry up in our state and elsewhere, it requires you to actually go out and think about how can you connect to donors? How can you sell your mission and what you do to donors? And that's where kind of connecting to core values comes in handy. But part of this is also strengthening networks that organizations are part of, helping them learn from each other, make referrals, reduce redundancies. Part of it's thinking about new revenue models. And part of it's thinking about the, the inputs that these organizations need to rise to the challenge. Some of that's leadership. Some of that's training tomorrow's leaders to, to better adapt and be more responsive. We do that here at SSA and at the University of Chicago. Part of it's thinking about funding for facilities. I had a executive director of an organization. I was talking to her about how her neighborhood was changing and how there had been a significant kind of period of gentrification and there, the, the low income family she served had moved away. And she was trying to figure out what to do. And she said, you know, I've been in this community for so long, I can go out and get a program grant from anybody. And pick up the phone, I can get somebody to fund a program because I'm well known, we do good work, but I can't get anybody to help me get a building so I can locate where all my, all my clients have moved to. I can't, get, I can't find an affordable space that's suitable for my clients in other places. And so facilities becomes a real big challenge. And then finally, it's important for us to maintain our public commitments. And I think in this current fiscal environment, it, we know that there will be cuts. And we know that we can't expand expenditures or, or spending or funding readily. But I think it's important to maintain our public commitments and for legislators to understand what especially social service funding but safety net assistance means in, in our communities. Um, not only do cuts affect people who receive services, but they destabilize the organizations on which people depend. And so when we cut funding today, it means that there aren't going to be organizations there a year or two years from now who can operate to help low-income families. And there, therefore, there's a, a ripple effect of sorts. Um, so with that, I will take your questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can I answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I really like the emphasis uh, that you make on um, systems not really being able to serve communities and that there are problems with systems in terms of service delivery and in terms of how we look at service delivery. But I wanted to make two or three points. One is that the, the changing geographic landscape in terms of uh, low-income people living in cities and now being pushed out to suburban communities so that when you say that in the suburban communities there is not enough services yet because the services are not following them to those locations. The other thing is that uh, one of the pieces that I didn't really see uh, you, you really talk about in terms of solutions is that when we look at community organization and community organizing. We're looking at grassroots community organizing. We need to think about how to really, uh, you know, how, how to really infuse more community organizing into this equation because that's one of the problems. Unless, pe unless poor people take up the initiative, it's really not gonna come from the top down. It's gonna come from the bottom up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, community organizing is critical not just to have, make sure people's voices are heard, but to, to uh, build stronger organizations, build stronger community-based organizations, and to, and, and to deliver programs that are relevant to people in the community that meet community needs. We want that kind of involvement. One of the things I talk about in my work is we often will focus on social service providers for what they deliver to, to people. Now, what job training program do I provide? What child welfare program do I provide? But actually, nonprofits are really critical to strong neighborhoods and vibrant communities. And if we don't have those organizations, not only are we not you know, helping people uh, who are looking for a job or who are trying to do better for their families, but we're not strengthening those neighborhoods. We're not uh, enhancing their voice. 
We're not ensuring they're represented. And so I think the community organizing piece is well taken. That's absolutely critical. Yeah, back. Okay. You, mentioned, you mentioned intergenerational poverty. A few years ago, The Economist magazine published an article saying that there were thousands of custodial grandmothers in Cook County, some of them raising their third or fourth generation of children. Uh, would there be some way that we can improve child support collections? And if we did, and got the money to the custodial grandmothers, wouldn't this eliminate a lot of the poverty? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think there's probably a number of things we could do to make the child support system work better. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's true for custodial grandmothers. Um, um, I think one of, the, one of the challenges is our system doesn't, doesn't really support the family very well, and it doesn't support um, dads trying to find jobs. And there aren't a lot of incentives often to participate. And so I, I think there's a lot more we could, we could do. Um, but I also would caution that most people who are struggling today don't fit that profile, right? There's a lot of people who are having a hard time making ends meet who, um, who uh, you know, may, may not fit a profile of a deadbeat dad or a family who's on the you know, third, fourth generation um, uh, um, poor. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, it's important to kind of keep in mind kind of uh, the factors that lead people to, 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 be, uh, to be in need. Yeah, I, I, you, you, more eloquently than I did, uh, kind of summarized the, the, the state of, of, of where we are. Uh, one thing you mentioned which resonated with me was how far flung people have become, especially uh, if you've um, been forced to leave a community because of the housing transformation plan or because, you know, your apartment complex has been torn down or, um, uh, you know, other, other uh, urban renewal realities. And that puts stress on you not only to move, find a, a, a new place to live and to, to navigate that new environment, but your social networks are gone. You're far away from your family. You're far away from the supportive community institutions that you might have turned to. And I think that creates a lot of stress. And I don't think we even have a, I think we're only beginning to understand in our city what's happened as a result of that. And I'm sure we'll look back a few years from now and realize that this, that, 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 that this mobility, which we was done in the name of opportunity, right? It was like these programs to promote mobility, right? tear down the housing projects and, and provide vouchers. That's done with this notion that there's no opportunity in cities and all the opportunities outside the city, right? That's kind of part of the driving logic there. But there's a cost to that, too, to having families far flung and separated and, um, and disconnected. So I think. Thank you for your comment. I thought that was very insightful. Yeah. I think there is a lot of hurt and anger in the inner city. 
I can't speak for everybody here, but I feel that I have a government that doesn't care about me, doesn't care about children. Somebody brought up, you know, we need places to uh, administer services, places for children to go after school. But we don't have any leadership. Our politicians are brain dead. <laughs> and I am so tired of paying them for nothing. <laughs> because they're not doing for, no, I mean this. They're not doing for the children. When you drive up and down the street and you see boarded up places, why isn't that a center? For the government who brought out the project's fine, they promised all of these transitional services. None were provided. Our politicians don't have enough sense to pick up a telephone, start writing some letters, and say, where are they? So it is a hurting thing today to be an American. Hmm. It, it just gets you at your heart. I'm a retired teacher, and I'm going to say this. I praise God that I am not teaching school now. Because if these folks think that the people whom they feel are disruptive and disturbing to American society and their neighborhoods, and they don't look at the idiot box, they know about all the money that was stolen. They know how we have been kicked in our teeth. If the fat cats gave up one-tenth of what they sold, we could retire the federal debt. So know that they know about it. And the angering thing is, they continue to expect us to pay for all this and be happy about it. I mean, when do we get, you know, if we were in France, we'd be in the street. They wipe our faces in all this mess, and we just sit back like sheep and I'm glad about it. And then family values, just the things we have discussed here. They don't respect any family. The money people respect family and stay married because they've got some money. She's not leaving him and he's not leaving her because they're not dividing up the money. But people who don't have any money, what do they care about our family values? What kind of example <coughs> are they putting before us? Our country is at I think you raise a really important point about leadership, and, and oftentimes we are focusing on national leadership, but many of these issues that we're talking about are driven by local leadership, or the lack thereof, and you see it manifest itself in all kinds of ways, some very subtle, and some very, very overt, um, but clearly if we're going to do better, we need better leadership, and I talked about nonprofit leadership, but there should have been a slide up there about better, got better governance, better city leadership, better county leadership. And so that, that resonates with me. Thank you for that comment. I wonder sometimes, and I just want to say this, about uh, we talk about our political leaders as public servants, okay? As a black person, with our history, we got a thing thing about the word servant. And mm -hmm. I do believe that our politicians have it as well. Because one thing I'm not seeing is service. Thank you for your comment. We'll, the next two here in the middle. Um, you started your talk by, by pointing out how we tend to equate poverty to urban and, and opportunity to suburban. And I think you demonstrated fairly convincingly that, the, that there's a lot more poverty in suburban areas than many people would think. But where does urban poverty, or rural, or rural poverty, uh, fit into this equation? Yes. Like there's, a, there's a large population of, of rural poor, yeah. it's very persistent poverty. This, this is a great question. I, I, as you can tell, I, I don't know if I did it well tonight, but my, my, my vice is a, is a vice? I don't think that's right. My, one of my problems as an instructor, you're a former teacher, you might, I try to pack too much into too much space, and I think actually, for those of you who see me speak before, I was about half speed of typical maybe, I don't know. So I did, I've done some rural work actually that looks at this stuff, and I think you, you hit it right on the head that, um, that one other place we've lost sight of in our country is, is kind of persistent rural poverty. Um, and it is, uh, it is a struggle in those communities for reasons 
that are different in some ways. Some of them are similar because the, the job loss and the persistent unemployment, uh, th those, those are, are true. But there are actually even fewer uh, safety net resources in those communities. And actually, in many places, the, 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 it's in rural America where cash assistance programs aren't as responsive because people aren't enrolling um, or they're not as available. And there's certainly not a, a nonprofit sector in many, non, in many rural communities um, that is strong enough to really help people a, a, attain self-sufficiency. And it, there aren't a lot of great solutions in those communities. Um, um, some places have been able to do well with some innovative strategies using you know, some social enterprise or social innovation, but it's, it, is, it is a hard road. And there are really, um, what I find is that the, the strength of the faith-based community and their commitment to, to helping is, is as key as anything. But uh, we could have taken urban or suburban out a lot of what I said tonight and dropped in rural and the story would have been very same. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah, I have a very basic question. I think it seems trivial. Um, we have been talking all the time about poverty, but could you perhaps just like uh, give a brief explanation of how you define poverty and what that means in like precise everyday terms that I could understand? Sure, yeah, I think this was one of those. Yeah, so he asked, how do you define, how do you define poverty in your work? Um, and so this is, a, again, you know, teaching at SSA, I feel like the, you know, the, the federal poverty line is something we teach our students on the first day. So this is my, my fault here again. Um, so my data looks at the federal poverty line, which is uh, based on a calculation created in the US in the mid-60s. It um, uh, was driven, uh, at that point, um, people spent most, um, a good chunk of their income, about a third of their income on food. And so the poverty line was based on a food basket in that, in that time period. And so today, and then they've adjusted it for inflation uh, through today. And uh, for a family of three, it's about $19,000 a year. Um, and it increases depending on how many adults or children you have. Um, but, you know, it, you, we all know it's hard to live on $19,000. And so oftentimes what I'll do in my work is talk about people who live near the poverty line. So within 150% of the federal poverty line, which is a little bit broader and, and captures a, a, a a wider range of people. But there are other ways to measure poverty. There are alternative poverty measures that take into account sources of income uh, or other costs that the household might incur. The government doesn't, hasn't historically collected data on that, although they are starting to under the Obama administration. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you talked about, in the beginning of your, of your talk, about how people move to the suburbs for that American dream. And so I guess my question, I'm wondering, I, know, I can think of answers anecdotally, but I wonder if your numbers have anything to suggest. So if the poverty is in the city and people move to the suburbs, you know, if the poverty is chasing the American dream, and now the poverty is chasing them into the suburbs, where is the American dream going? Are people going further, further out and that maybe becomes rural? Or are they going back into cities? Where is the American dream now? This is a profound question. Where is the American dream gone? That's uh smart SSA student right there. Um, um, I think it's a good question. I, I'm one thing I would, I would, I, I would just as a, as a note, a, a lot of the, the increases in poverty aren't just because people are moving out, right? So people are moving out to suburbs to look for jobs for a long time, and they were successful. Unemployment rates in suburbs are much lower than in cities, you know, under 5% in, um, uh, prior to the, to the, uh, to the recession. Um, and so to the extent that you could have the American dream on whatever job you found out there, it was, it was possible, perhaps. Um, I think what's happened is that the, you know, we, in, in SSA we talk about how the, 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 there was massive job loss in cities since 1970. And that is starting to happen in suburbs, where the good paying jobs that you can get without a college degree have started to dry up. Some of the manufacturing jobs have gone away. And so it is a real question, can you get can you get the, the American dream in, in these communities? Um, I, think there's, I, th I think there's still a lot of um, uncertainty into where we end up. Th these trends are so recent in some ways um, that I don't think we know how, people, how this is going to shake out. Will people move back to the city? Will you get gentrification in the city? Will you get people moving further out? Um, one thing we know is that people are moving back to the south. Um, uh, African-American families are moving back to the South in large numbers, um, in part because the labor markets uh, and, uh, are better there and the cost of living is better 
Um, and so maybe that's what we see. Maybe we start to see shifts, regional shifts in population. Um, one thing we probably will see is people moving away from rural areas to metropolitan areas, and that's a trend we've seen for the last several decades and, and one that will probably continue. Um, but, uh, you know, I think you got a title for your, your first book, where, where is the American Dream? That's a great one. Let me get someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Yeah. To the suburbs, can I? Um, with the shift of some of the poverty uh, to the suburbs, is has there been a noticeable impact on educational or, uh, I guess, on academic achievement in the suburbs? And um, do you think there's a causal relationship? And do you think it's too early to tell? This is a good question. I actually am talking with one of my doctoral students next week about about this. I don't know a lot about education. Um, but in t what I've picked up uh, along doing work to date on this project are a few things. One, um, there are levels of, of racial and ethnic segregation in suburban school districts uh, today that rival what you might have seen in cities in the, in the 50s and 60s in the U.S. where, uh, if, if, where you're, uh, if you're a black or, or Hispanic youth, you're going to a school that's predominantly black or Latino. Um, and, and I don't know... I, I don't have good data on that. I've just these are kind of an, an analogous data that I've picked up from, from talking to school administrators as we've been doing our field work. I think there are, there are big challenges for the schools in these communities. You see it not just in providing you know, free and reduced lunch, um, uh, but in all kinds of other um, uh, issues that, that the students are bringing to school that are coming in with greater frequency than before. Um, I would imagine you'll start to see this in school performance. Um, but um, I'm, but but I think it's I think this is still, to some degree, uncertain. Um, I think some of the challenges that suburban schools are facing, um, uh, that that I think are particularly um, salient in the work that I've done, are uh, working uh, with children who come from um, families where English isn't the primary spoken language, and the challenges that provides. I was at a um, a youth a youth program facility, what would you call it? Like a community center, I guess. That's what you'd call it. It's a place where they have programs for kids, you know, from five to, you know, 12. And uh, the, the staff was telling me that often um, the kids are the interpreter for the parents. And so when a form needs to be signed or when something happens, it's often the kid negotiating between the staff person and the parent. And I think that must, not only is it hard then for our teachers and our community leaders and our service providers, but it's hard for those children. I mean, you think about the responsibility those kids bear as being the translator in, the, in that household. Um, but I think this is a great question. I think there's a lot of room to, to do good work in this area. Just want to mention quickly, um, in education, when you hear the word suburb a lot, it's in the context of how much money is being spent per child mm -hmm. per year on their education. And so that might just be something to look at. So is, a, does a, does, uh, is there a change in per child spending? Yeah, it's 20 something thousand per year per yeah. child in the suburb yeah. suburbs versus um, seven to 9,000 per child in the US, in yeah. the, in, sorry, in right. Chicago. Right, I mean, this is one of these data points people point to uh, when they talk about the divide between urban and suburban America, and it's the resources that we can dedicate, that we choose to dedicate in, to suburbs as opposed to urban schools. Thank you. concerned about there were no data that was collected in regards to any of the other ethnic groups and I wanted to know why is it that they don't have the problems that the uh, other groups have? It's a great question. It was to try to um, provide as simple a tables as possible. Um, I think the needs of, of, so you were saying that like, I only had like black Latino on the screen for the most part? Um, yeah, this is a good question. So, actually, the the, the there are the data is there. The, the, the data is there. I just didn't I didn't present it because the story is a little different. And um, 
And also with ethnicity, uh, the story is really different depending on when, if you're an immigrant, when you're when you entered the country, and so it becomes complicated to talk about all those different groups. Um, certainly, in the in the papers and reports, we break out um, other other ethnic groups. In Chicago, though, it's primarily uh, you know kind of the metropolitan. The biggest groups are going to be you know non non Hispanic whites, Hispanics, blacks. And, and then Asian Americans. And then you have some, you know, growing population of, of uh, Southeast Asians and, 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 and Arab Americans in certain neighborhoods. Um, yeah, 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 it's just, it's really, I, so maybe I didn't give a very good answer. I, it's really, it was just trying to be simple with the tables, um, but not, it shouldn't be taken as a dismissal of those groups and how important they are. Like Hispanic or Hispanics. Poverty rates among other ethnic groups are much lower, with the exception of, of uh, Native American uh, or Pacific Islanders. Um, it depends, though, also on what where you where you come from. So even within the, the Hispanic community, um, uh, Mexican Americans have higher poverty rates than other you know people from other uh, countries of origin. And the same is true for South Asians or Southeast Asians or East Asian uh, immigrants. Where you come from, where you come from, and when you came determine a lot about the poverty rate, and it becomes a complicated, it, be, it becomes complicated to do in a session when I want to focus on um, on, on kind of the, core, the the larger groups. Um, but it's really important. Actually, I should have a slide that does that says something about that. I mean, then then it would then it wouldn't be like I'm talking as if the country's only like three groups or something. I think that would be a really it's a it's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Michael, my friend, and I'll come up here to, to the right one. I had a question about the uh, lack of the uh, safety net in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, is there an awareness of that lack of the safety net by, you know, in state houses, by private donors, by um, founders of nonprofits, and uh, and then where do you see that going over the next 10 years based on that awareness or, or lack of? Actually, I should, have, I should have turned to you to answer the school's question. You're the uh, education, one, I know you're an education expert. Um, so when you talk to community-based organizations in the suburbs, they're acutely aware of what's happened because they're, the lines out their doors have gotten longer, either figuratively or actually. Um, and um, they are confronting a political environment where their local leaders don't fully grasp what's happening. They also don't understand how important social service programs are to their community. One of the, one of the realities of the, of, of the social service sector is the rise of this to $200 billion a year didn't come with one piece of legislation. It's been built piecemeal over the last 25 or 30 years and it comes from all kinds of different federal and state grants or programs. And so it's possible for a legislator to be in the state house for a long time and not, not actually know how much money is going into their district. It, it goes through all kinds of different channels and it, it is, it's convoluted. The, I think the, the mission or the task uh, for those nonprofit providers in cities and in suburbs is to do a better job of communicating what they're getting, how important it is, how it translates into jobs, right? And social service providers are huge sources of employment in communities. Um, and that matters. Um, I think people are starting to realize that this is an issue. I think where the biggest disconnect is going to be with the politicians and then with donors. And one of the challenges that providers talk about um, when they're operating not only in central city neighborhoods but in out, outside in, in suburban neighborhoods is the, the challenge they face connecting to, their lo to the local donor base. Um, and so, you know, one... Um, one poignant example of this was, was I was out at a food bank that operates out in the suburban collar counties, and she was telling me that a lot of the volunteers, when they come in the door, say, yeah, I give to you, and then they check the records, and they don't. They give to the, the, the food bank that operates in the city of Chicago, but they don't understand, maybe, which, who they're giving to, or they don't understand that there's two different ones. Um, 
And certainly they think, when they think poverty, they think, and in philanthropy, they think the city. And so that's a disconnect that, that organizations have to, to work around. And that's why connecting to the values piece is so important because um, that, I think that mobilizes um, giving. I, my, did I get, did I get? Oh. You know, I, I think the state budget issues are really, it, it's, it's hard to know uh, and, the, and where the federal government goes. Um, My, my, I mean, my sense is that, that no matter how, how much attention we bring to this, there's going to be some painful cuts. Um, and whether, whether the philanthropic sector can step in or not remains to be seen. I mean, you know, their endowments are down, and private giving is still down. Um, I, I think, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic we could do better, but I also am fearful that... Um, that the, the job's gonna get much harder once we get on the other side of these budget cycles. And maybe, you know, maybe that's what needs to happen so we're in a stronger place. I mean, one of the realities of state government funding and social services benefited from this was during the boom of the, the first decade, just like people spent money on houses that weren't worth what they thought they were and borrowed against house values that they didn't, that you know, weren't what they thought they were worth, State government spent all those tax revenues too, right? And we jacked up our spending across the board and now we have to reset, just like homeowners have to reset. That's necessary, it's gonna be painful. I think, if, I think in the long term, I think the key to doing better is gonna be having better regional governance around these issues. Yeah, um, oh yeah, go to Karen, I'll go to the back uh, in the coat. So. Um, can you do a projection? Is poverty gonna rise again mm -hmm. next 10 years? Poverty will rise probably for the next couple years. The, uh, just like unemployment, you remember that chart I showed you unemployment, how unemployment rates continue to rise after the end of that last recession? Um, poverty rates actually are less responsive to economic re recovery than unemployment. And so we'll have um, probably poverty rates that get close to 15% for the next several years, and then they'll start to tail off. Actually, having done most of my life's work in another state, I think I have a different perspective. Um, What's fascinating about Illinois is that given its number of academic institutions, its law schools, its medical schools, and its number of Nobel Prizes, of which, frankly, we're standing in the zone here of Nobel Prizes, um, given the total of those, we are second in this country only to California. We rank, we used to rank in the top 10 in terms of total wealth in the state, I think we're in the last issue is that we're in the top 13, but we have always ranked in the bottom 10% of how we treat mental illness, how we treat poverty, how we have all, and, and in large part, I think it's because there is no conduit between how we analyze data and how we create public policy. And I think it's, it's, really, it's really astonishing. What other states do, and what other large cities do, is they actually do best practices. They look around the rest of the United States, find out what's worked, how it works. When they create legislation, they add to the legislation a academic study, usually by the state university, although at the University of, uh, uh, though in, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, they often use Mar uh, Marquette uh, because of its economics department. And so what they do is they put as an addendum to every piece of legislation a mechanism for a yearly evaluation of the cost benefit of the legislation and whether or not the legislation was effective. And I, 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 I'm just astonished that in our state we don't do that. Um, even though our state, among other things, has a center called the Uniform Public Law Commission, which does it for all the rest of the United States and doesn't effectively do it here. Um, I really would like you to comment on that because I, this is brilliant stuff. Um, I lived in the south suburbs here in, in uh, Chicago when the transition happened. Nobody in the south suburbs was informed that the, state, that the city was getting rid of the Chicago Housing Authority and the only Chapter 8 uh, housing was actually going to be in the south suburbs. I mean, there's, there, it's, it's, there's a, do you know what I'm saying? There's a uh, tragic disconnect. It's almost like a Greek tragedy of huge, yeah. and this young, this, you know, this, this former teacher 
when she says her heart's breaking, it's breaking because, damn it, she's a teacher and she knows it should be better. Yeah. <laughs> you, guys, you guys raise great points and ask tough questions, and I'm glad that uh, this isn't, you know, my daily class. I think I'd be wiped out. Um, I, uh, I think... I think one of the things, so if we were gonna, if we were gonna talk about how do you translate research into practice, um, right, there's ways you can do it, right? Um, I think at SSA we do it okay. Um, I think we, we do well connecting our research to the community and engaging the community in, in the work we do. I think, it's, I think it's hard though, I don't think it comes to academics naturally. I think one thing, if I were to challenge my colleagues, not necessarily my colleagues in this room or in the school, but elsewhere, is, is to, to, to think about ways that you could take what you know and make it actionable, turn it into, turn it into information that people can use. I think the other side is you need to have receptive ears, right? And certainly, I, I think in the, in the nonprofit community in Chicago, one of the things that's great about Chicago compared to where I've lived is there are, there's a strong nonprofit and, and foundation community that's unlike in a lot of other places. And I think they, they are receptive. I think you raise a point about, about the political leadership or about policymakers, whether they're able to be receptive or willing. And I think that's a good, uh, it's, a, it's a good point. I think it's one that could we I, should push. Could, uh, could I just make a suggestion that you send some of these brilliant graduate students you have, send them to another state legislature to see how this tremendous, important analysis actually impacts on legislation and monitoring of the legislation. Because I think that's the problem. The problem is that there's so much fraud and abuse. There's so much throwaway stuff. There's so much ineffective legislation. Nobody's even keeping track of the dollars in our state. Um, and well, that's it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great point. I think we have time for one, one more, or is that it? This is brilliant stuff and an incredibly important conversation. And I can assure you all that Professor Allard will be with us again next year. So if we could limit it to one more and one then a more, big hand. One more question, perhaps someone hasn't spoken, and I'll, I'll turn it to you. I heard you mention that um, basically, like you thought that, you know, connecting the research with the community, that you all did okay with that. But I was one, you know, I've just, I've been in Chicago my whole life. And I was just informed, you know, that the University of Chicago is like the leading place in studying and researching our communities. So I want to know who is researching us, you know, because I am who you're researching and I didn't even know you were researching me. You know, make me a part of your team. Yeah, if you're yeah. going to research yeah. me or you, you know, you're going to make laws about me, let me be a part of, of the program. I, you know, I, it's like the face of who's researching and who's making the laws are not the face of the people who you're researching. Yeah, it makes no. no sense. I take that point uh, to heart. I, and I think, I, I don't want to speak for the broader university on this. I think you raise a point, for those of us who've lived, I've only lived here a few years, but those of us who are long-term residents know that the university hasn't always done a good job of engaging the community around it or or, or including people uh, in, in research in a way that's, um, that, 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 that's uh, equitable or meaningful, right? Um, there's been a one-way transaction. I think in the projects that I've been involved with, um, I mean, this is, this is just looking at data on a screen, but in the stuff that I've done in the community, I've actually tried to, to either give talks, engage people in small groups, get feedback, or some of the stuff's actually really community, community participatory. Um, because I said SSA does an okay job or a good job doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing better. And the fact that we haven't reached you, clearly someone who's smart and thinking about these things, means we're not doing a good enough job with our outreach and we're not taking what we know and translating the things that are useful. Um, but I do, I, I do take your point seriously um, about the face of the, the, the scholar versus the face of the the, the respondent to the survey. And I think that's, I always keep that in mind. And, and, and part of why I do talks like this, part of why I, I go out and do work with community-based groups is to ensure that I don't take that for granted or lose sight of that, I guess. So, um, but we could do better. How'd you learn about us? I actually learned about um, you 
all through my professor, Dr. Harrison, yeah. who is an alumni from here. So, and where are you in school? Kennedy King. So, you know, it's like, it's so many of us who want to be a part of this team and want to make this work. If you all want to help us, we're willing to help you help us. We're not just sitting here and we're waiting on everybody to come and save us. We want to be a part, but then we're like, how, how can I be a part? You know, there's so many biases that into to getting in this university and this stuff. So let alone me making it to that program. How am I even going to get here, you know? And then just the resources and opportunity to my people, it's like we don't even have the opportunity to even come this way because it's up here. You know, so we want to be here and we want to help. So, you know, it's... It's just that that part bothers me. So I'm here and I hear you and I, you know, I hear all the, the other different things, but it's like I still feel disconnected because you are not working with me. I'm not working with you. It's like you're you're studying me, but you know, I hear you like I'm, I'm engaging you all and I try to keep that in mind. But I wish more people would think about that and and, and let us help you help us because you can't help me. If you don't really relate to me. I think that's a great way to, 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 to finish up, actually, because it's a great statement about how we should be thinking about our research as a university, and it's a great challenge for me to keep thinking about how I could do different, better, and so I appreciate it. You gave me some, some serious homework for the, to pursue. Thank you. I'm sorry. We've got to finish up. Thank you.